Hi folks, Trappy Friday again. Oh, wow, look what I have here. Four champagnes today. What kind of color? Pinkish, red, orange, purple, rosé champagne. Uh, is it a coincidence that I picked those four for today? Actually not. I decided this morning because we've decided long ago that we're going to make a Champagne Hiking Friday film here in this spot, very close to the place where Bjorn Schöne lives and it's his birthday. So I brought some great champagne for him just to drink a little bit later. So after this session, he can drink all of these bottles by himself and uh, perhaps share a little with people who are just walking by. Um, but before that will happen, I decided this morning because of the weather. We had a couple of days with a blonde, blonde weather, very strong summer winds, etc. Today, slightly cloudy and crispy notes again. We're up to 17, 18 degrees with a slight wind. And what should we have then for champagne hiking? Very obvious, rosé champagne. And when I pre-tasted these four, that was not only obvious, it was extremely obvious that it's perfection because all four are shining like diamonds in their own category just by standing here in this light and with this breeze that we have. You know, rosé champagne or pink champagne, as it very often is called as well, has been so neglected over the years and at some periods the other way around. It's been so upheighted and, and people say that rosé champagne is the only thing I drink, I prefer it much more. What's the truth? The truth for me with rosé champagne is it's depending on who's making it, it's depending on the vintage and the occasion. Uh, rosé could be as good as better or less good. A general rule is that as soon as you have a lot of Chardonnay in the base, it's not as great as when you have a very big heavyweight of Pinot Noir. And we have that in three of them, but we also have one which is 90% Chardonnay. And you know, there are some really famous and wonderful Chardonnay-based champagnes in the Rosé category. I'm thinking about Dom Renard, thinking about Celos Rosé. And here is Victor Rosé Cuvée Mandois. Uh, so let's see how that is. But we're starting with the most obvious and most typical of all villages for Rosé. The one that I fell in love with, with the Flignot Rosé and Colliery Rosé in the early 90s. I remember especially one time when I met, met uh, uh, my, at that time, girlfriend, and we went to Switzerland. We stayed in this absolutely wonderful setting overlooking a uh, turquoise lake and white snow tops and a lot of flowers. And we brought Flignot and Colliery side by side. And we finished those and said, this is the best thing you can drink when you make a hiking. Before the term was uh, known as champagne hiking. So, Gatinoir, 90% Pinot Noir, 10% Chardonnay, everything from a single village, i.e. Little bit copper notes, a little bit uh, white stinge to it, but clear, strong red color. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, ooh, I'm flying back to the Swiss Alps. I would love to go there as well soon, but it's quite beautiful here in Stockholm as well. So for Bjorn Kahn's uh, wonderful uh, birthday, I will say cheers to the camera and cheers to Bjorn who's standing over there. Uh, you will not have any problem drinking this one because it's so typical and it's so much great start of the summer. If I pinpoint the, the most specific aromas, I will say the first thing is a, a very gentle but very high class Cotubon uh, red wine from Burgundy. That's the first thing you notice. There's a little bit of those things you have, uh, the leather, you have a little bit of, of the hazelnutty complexity that you should have in IE, but most of all, you have the mashed strawberries with a little hint of uh, orange. We have Paul Allen behind the camera today. 
So um, um, I know that I become a little bit nervous. And normally when Paul and I are making films together, we are flying across the globe, but today we are very close to our homes in, in Stockholm. Very high notes on this one. 2020 base. Uh, great freshness, youth of course, but a big wine. Really, really big and at the same time flattering. So I think it's uh, for the wide audience and also for the connoisseurs to age. And I'm very happy today that we also know that we have the base. And in the tasting library today, I'm always writing when I know which the base is because the differences, even in the non-vintage category, are rather big. Second, Cuvée Prestige. Here it is. Victor Brut Rosé, Mandois Vieille Vigne. 90 Chardonnay, 10 Pinot Noir. Everything single in the arts, uh, single village as we had in the previous one. Pierre. Uh, quite important Premier Cru next to Epernay. And uh, the old vines from there is exactly what we brought uh, into this wine. Vievin, yes, you can see that. The intensity is so great and everything is very much connected to the butterscotchy notes, a little caramel. Not the same astringency, not the same pure class, but a bigger wine on the nose, very, very rich. Huh. I get a berry, which I don't know the name in English. It's called Rönnberg. So Herman. Rowanberry. What? Rowanberry. Rowanberry, like Rouen, the Rowan city berry. in France. Rönnberries, very acidic, also a little bit bitter notes. And even when you smell them, it's, it's there. Be beautiful complexity, high intensity, not as many notes, not as pure and strict as the first one, but a lovely rosé champagne. Color-wise, we are now entering something very deep. Why? Why is this? 60% Pinot Noir, 40% Chardonnay. We add something else. 100% oak barrels. Vilmar, before it was called Rubis, today it's called Emotion. It's exactly the same wine as before. And it's uh, Rigi La Montagne, 14 and 15. Always this very strong tip, typicity from the producer. And what is that? It's, I tried to describe it so many times, but, but it's, I would say it's so much easier to find it than describe it because it's a, it's a personal note that no one else got. It's basically coming from the, from the barrels, most of it, and the non malo the very high acidity, from villages that normally don't produce grapes with, with a high natural acidity. So you have this almost harsh attack that you can sense already on the nose. If you compare to the Cœur de Cuvée or the Blanc de Blanc from Villemar directly, we have the red berries, which is the strongest part, which is uh, completely different. But also olives and licorice, which is something you never find in the white Vilmars. Differences between the two, let's see. 14. Beautiful balance. Not as strong as many of this, the previous vintages from this from this wine, a little bit shorter, but beautiful acidity. <laughs> 2015, like a bomb, what is happening? <laughs> it's so huge, it's, it makes me laugh. It's so grand, perhaps not as elegant as the 14, but sitting here directly, I would say, I can't do anything than being impressed. It's an intensity that strikes me 
almost like a grange from Australia or something like that when you get the, the first punch. It's the warm climate type of aromatics. It's a huge fruit and it's a typical Vilmar and probably the biggest, not the best, but the biggest rosé they ever made. Skål Björnstjärne, congratulations. I should sing uh, Hadenäran, but I'm not. So see you next Friday, guys. <laughs>